أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم من أمسي ونفخير في اسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسولنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه So as always, um, some updates from you guys. How is everything? Um, any any particular uh, thoughts? Um, any updates? Any reflections? Anything? Uh, last time, what we talked about was a little bit about uh, the difference between our truth and uh, the the capital T truth. So we set it in the framework of Maqasid al-Sharia, and we sort of introduced the topic a little bit. We didn't go into, uh, we, we went into some detail, but not extremely, uh, uh, we didn't go into an extreme, dis- uh, extreme detailed analysis, right? So let me... Um, let me give you that a little bit today. Uh, now, the way that this is, the way that the framework is working is that um, maslaha in this context right here is what they have sort of um, framed uh, this concept of the five things that we talked about. The maqasid are, you know, there's different tiers or different levels of them. Um, and in this context, the idea of masha was to rectify things, to make things work out better, um, things like that. And so fuqaha are going to be making this distinction when it comes to you know their, their discussions about a particular matter. So they have uh, three categories as we talked about: the the duriyat, which are the necessities, the complement, uh, or the uh, the uh, hajiyat which are complementary, uh, complementary things. Uh, and then there's tahsiniyat, which is sort of like the perfection of things that kind of like beautifying the putting, uh, decorating it pretty much. Uh, so this is, this is how they framed it. And of the necessities, you have these five um, that we talked about last time. Now today, uh, let's go into a little bit of detail about each of them. So you can, get a ha- you can have an idea of how to how to frame everything when you're working with you know your when you're working uh, with other people when you are sort of planning your life together um, or, or um, putting plan, planning your life in, in the sense of you know how you're navigating it what your goals are ambitions are and sort of planning to align with um, what is what is you know the way that let's not going to design everything in the framework uh, when it comes to preservation of uh, Al-mal, right? So this is your property and wealth. We talked about that the fact that Allah SWT encourages you to have, uh, you know, money and so on. What I want to do is I want to see if you guys can think of certain prescriptions in deen that sort of uh, fall into these categories, but uh, sort of in the framework of Allah SWT encouraging you certain things. Okay? So if you guys can have, if you guys can you know, give some uh, feedback or uh, just sort of like come up with answers uh, that can help you, inshallah. So any any prescription that you know of in deen, um, sort of put it into the category so we can frame it accordingly. And so I have a chart over here that I want to fill out um, as you guys are telling me. And uh, if you guys don't have anything, then I'll go ahead and start uh, mentioning those things, inshallah. But in the meantime, uh, remember these five right here. So protection of uh, wealth and property and so on, and mal. Uh, preservation of a nest, which is lineage. Uh, you can also put uh, honor over here. So sometimes they combine these two uh, lineage slash honor, right? And then there's also preservation of intellect, and that's al uh, aql And the preservation of a nafs and preservation of it, the nafs is soul. So preservation of life. Right, and, and preservation of a deen, which is Islam. So that's that. And, and sometimes people might think that this is like all religions and so on. But Islam specifically in here is preserving the deen. So that helps you protect everything else that's inside of deen, right? So whatever the legislations are of deen, so they can be preserved the entire deen is preserved, meaning Islam is preserved. So that's specifically referring to Islam over here. So remember these five. And uh, let's let's come up with a list of some of those truths, right? Um, 
if you want to go ahead and uh, mention some things, we'll go ahead and like um, list them, and then uh, we'll compare the capital T truths with the small T truths according to Inshallah. So uh, let's get started. I'm, I'm going to get out of this mode, and we will be, we'll go from there, Inshallah. Okay, so if you guys want to go ahead and mention something. So you want an example like from a hadith or something that like where we learn about preserva preservation of uh, whatever one of these things? Yes, so if you have any th th like any, anything that you know of the right? So for example, any, any law that you have that you can think of. I want to make sure that Sharia is understood in the right way. So that mm -hmm. means like, anything that you know of Sharia, right? any, any law, any rule, any principle, any anything that we sort of uh, adopted in our lives, but um, we sort of framed in a certain way. Right? So we're going to frame it the right way, if it's not framed the right way. And we're going to talk about how it's actually beneficial to, to individuals and to to mankind and to humankind, uh, sorry, uh, to like uh, to like all, all of creation and so on. So that's the idea of it. So sometimes we sort of uh, compartmentalize something in a certain context. So we're going to mm -hmm. that it's only applicable in a certain context, but it might actually be uh, very pervasive in the sense it's applicable in the entire you know existence. Uh, one uh, one that comes to mind is uh, for the preservation of life, um, applying the death penalty. Okay. to someone who kills someone okay uh death penalty right yeah okay so how is death penalty a good thing and how how is it something that's not like barbaric and so on how, how is that part of islam because it prevents um people from like like killing others in the future like if they see what's going to happen to them they're going to be more inclined to not do it Okay, good. So in the first place, the Surah An-Nur, for example, Allah SWT mentions that, uh, so let them uh, witness, let a group of people witness, a group, a group of the believers witness the punishment that's going to happen. So for example, if a person is, um, is, is making up lies about another person, right? Um, when it comes to somebody saying that a part of the committed sinna, for example, if, 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 sorry, if, if somebody's claiming that she has committed zina, um, but she hasn't, then that's a lie, right? And that's a good lie. So that lie because, you know, that type of lie, that topic, for a woman, it's a huge thing. Yeah. So that's why that has a consequence of some people. Then he thinks over here, well, yes, she has a lie, but who's not lying for the woman that they need? So that a group of the believers, in other words, this is supposed to be an active deterrent. And so death penalty is supposed to be an active deterrent when it comes to zina itself as well. This was, this was the punishment, you know, when, when um, uh, the punishment, for example, if you lie, or, you know, um, there's whips and stuff that you have to get, you lie, uh, 80 times you whip and stuff, right? So uh, that's that. But then when it comes to, uh, if a person actually commits zina, for example, there's like, you know, a little bit more, um, and so depending on the situation, um, you know, after after the case it could conclude after it's investigated and so on, there's been witnesses and so on, and so on right? After that, the end pen penalty um, is that if a person was not married, then they get a certain punishment. And then once they were married, then they get a more severe punishment, right? So the idea pretty much behind this is that it's supposed to protect the families, it's supposed to, you know, protect, you know, the honor of society, uh, the honor of people within it. Uh, it's supposed to make sure that you have strong family units and stuff. For example, um, if, if, you know, if you have uh, parents and these parents have, you know, this thing that they're really loyal to each other, they're, you know, they're with the kids and stuff, they're, you know, it's a nice family and stuff, right? Uh, then that, that helps, you know, develop a strong society. But then if people are cheating on each other, for example, then that causes a lot of negative, you know, uh, it causes a lot of negative um, cycles to sort of start up and kind of perpetuate onward to the next generation and stuff, right? Um, so, for example... If a woman, uh, if a woman finds out that her husband was cheating on 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 her, right, then that can have a really deep impact on a, on a family. And so, 
that right there is what Allah Taala wants to protect in, in the sense of like make sure that does not happen, right? And so Allah Taala has a punishment associated with um, with a person committing zina when they're married because it breaches the trust of you know between spouses and so on. It has this you know impact when it comes to uh, the the parents and the kids and so on. There's there's a lot of Im- negative impacts that have and then it Im- impacts society in a certain way because maybe the person that that other you know the spouse sort of cheated with. Um, then that other person uh, might have issues there too. For example, they might be cheating on somebody, for example, um, uh, themselves. Maybe they were married too, or maybe they weren't married, but then they have this issue, you know, they get, they have uh, relationships and so on. And and then the idea of uh, what's sacred is sort of like taken away. And so people do whatever they want and stuff, then they don't give really care about uh, lineages and so on. Um, and then it becomes a big mess, so, uh, for example. Okay, so we're talking about uh, death penalty here. Okay, so that penalty is, you know, uh, uh, in a way, or in this way, it's, it's supposed to be a big deterrent from things that can make people um, uh, get impacted in a very negative way, right? Okay, another thing that death penalty is associated for is when a person kills another person, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa mentions in there that... Um, for the believers in the penalty when, they, when they're in, uh, implementing this penalty that there is life in it uh, for, for there is a life in it when you kill somebody we are the, in the death, death penalty when a person has killed somebody else right so there is death in uh, there's a there's a life in there that you're actually getting out of this okay so the question is how is it that there's uh, how is there a life coming out of you know this death penalty so, like Allah Taala says, "Walakum fil qisas hayatun yaul al alba bin al lakum taqoon." That in this uh, this qisas, right, uh, there's a life. Uh, oh, you who uh, have deep understanding, uh, alba, right? La al lakum taqoon, so you can have taqwa. So, how is your life in the death penalty when you have a person who committed, you know, a murder, for example, or they killed somebody, for example, and you have to. Uh, uh, you have to, you have to, you know, let's say in this case that they have to be, like the family chooses, you know, the, the victim's family chooses that this person needs to be killed, for example, um, and they, they chose not to, like, you know, forgive. They want to, like, get justice for that person, and so they get the equal, you know, uh, death for death, sort of, right? If they want to do that, um, then in that case, there is life. So how is there life in there um, when you're actually killing somebody? So the answer is that, obviously, um, you're killing somebody, but it's actually, as a deterrent for a, for everyone else, number one, and number two, knowing this fact actually makes it more difficult for a person to kill another person in the first place. So people are more uh, more concerned with the sanctity of life because of the fact that you're going to get killed at the end of the day, right? So there's like a big deterrent over here, so the person is not even going to kill in the first place. But even if they do kill, right? Even despite this, like you know, this understanding that if I do something like this, I am gonna get killed and stuff, and that's a big deal, right? So if they know that they're not gonna be able to get away with it, that this is, you know, that they're gonna get at the end of the day, then they're, they're less likely to kill. And if there's less, less likely, to, if they're less likely to kill, then as a society, there's more safety and security and so on, right? So there's well-being and there's protection for the, you know, for everyone else that's in, in the society. So imagine that like, you know, you're living in a society where if you kill somebody, you're going to get killed too and stuff, right? So you're not going to take this lightly. You're not going to think that, you know, you're just going to go into the prison system and you're just going to get out of, you know, a few years later and stuff. Or maybe like, you know, you just get off of a, te- off a technicality, you know, in whatever and stuff, right? No, you, if you kill somebody and, you, you know, um, it, it's clear that you kill that person, it's not going to be like you're going to get out of that. You're just stuck with that. So the society as a whole is going to become a lot safer because you're not going to do that act in the, in the first place. So it's okay. It's, a, it's something that prevents you from actually committing the crime. But also on top of that, it makes it so that you're uh, less likely, uh, or sorry, the other people are less likely to follow you once they see that you were killed, for example, right? And, and that's why, you know, in Islam, a lot of these punishments are public so that, you know, everyone knows that this is going to happen and they see what happens and they see the impact of it on themselves. Right? Imagine if you're seeing somebody sort of getting killed in front of you and, and you're, you know, you're, it's open to the public to be seen. Um, I know that in, in the Saudi for example, uh, it is something that they do publicly. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of people that say it's not okay, it's not good, whatever. But that's not data. Um, and again, I'm not saying like, you know, their justice system is perfect and stuff. No, I'm not saying that. But I'm saying the, like when people see, you know, the, the, um, uh, the uh, the punishment
punishment being carried out. You know, I'm not talking that the topic of whether they were, you know, wrongly or correctly uh, uh, killed or whatever. That's a different topic or, or like punished. Um, but but my, my point is like when you actually see the actual thing happening, it does have an impact on you to the point that you just, you know, you understand that you're not going to be able to get away with like, you know, loopholes and things like that. Like that there is like, you know, seriousness and stuff. And, and in Islam, the more severe punishment is, right? The uh, the more uh, uh, the more uh, weighted a matter is, the more severe the punishment is, right? So, for example, accusing a woman of you know committing zina, for example, um, without having like you know actual proof and evidence and stuff like that, right? For example, in this case, there is a huge punishment that a person will have to go through. So, for example, they get whipped eighty times, but also their their uh, their uh, their word is not taken any, anymore. Their testimony is rejected after that, unless they repent and they do certain things and stuff like that, right? So it's a huge thing that they're doing. So therefore, there's a huge punishment attached to it. There's a huge uh, harm uh, to society uh, and to individuals. And so Allah Taala has therefore assigned a huge penalty for that. There's a huge punishment that you have to go through if you do that. So if you if you think about it like that, even death penalty becomes a very positive thing. In fact, you can see when there's death penalty that's not implemented, then the harms of society um, are, are, you know, they become uh, very common and very apparent and stuff. So in the context of, uh, you know, the, the small t truths, um, the alternative that they have here is life imprisonment, right? And uh, no death penalty or, or like minimal death penalty. No death penalty. Okay, so let me put a question mark over there. So they have this idea of life imprisonment, right? What that means is, I, I if I commit a crime, um, you know, instead of killing killing people, what they're gonna do is put them in cages. And what that means is that you just put them in a cage where you know they become human, uh, like animals in a way where you, you know how you have pets or you have um, uh, you, you get like you know. Uh, wild animals and sort of you put them in cages and stuff and you know zoos and stuff right so it's sort of like you're putting human beings into that kind of you know like a, a cage right they're just stuck in there and that's it you just kind of sort of watch them like kind of like you know live their you know life out until they die so life imprisonment if they get a life sentence then they're going to die in prison right so you essentially you're killing them but but you're just saying that you know uh, just to make yourself feel better you're not gonna like kill them, kill them, but you're gonna put them in a cage where they're gonna essentially die anyways because that's what they're bound to. Like that, that's the the the, um, the punishment that their freedom is taken away uh, until they die, right? And so they're gonna be pretty much put in these cages where you give them some food, you know, you know, just like you do for animals and stuff that you have in cages. You give them food, you let them use the toilet there and stuff, and they go, they sleep over there, and then that's it, right? Sometimes you might let them out to play with other people and stuff, or you know, other animals and stuff, or you know whatever. And then you put them back in their cages and stuff, right? But this is the thing. So is this really like the justice, you know, that that actually helps society? Is this really like where you can actually uh, fix society, or is, or is this kind of uh, imprisonment bringing down society? It's actually harming society and other people that may not be. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, for example, in this case, the distribution of justice is it really happening to? everyone equally or is it only being applied to certain weak people out of the society and so on right uh, weak or sort of like you know the people that have been sort of uh, focused on uh, in terms of you know this this uh, criminal justice system for example or whatever it might be so this is the, qu the question over here um, is it really bringing uh, ben like if, is it really benefiting society as a whole some statistics that i was looking at and uh, I, you know uh, they were looking they were comparing um, and you know, people are gonna like you know, nest, like always gonna dispute things and stuff. You're always gonna have people that like uh, question everything and stuff, and they you know, and they're skeptics. And, stuff. and I'm not saying being skeptic, skeptic is necessarily a bad thing or a good thing, but I am saying that this there is this um, there's this statistics that I was looking through, um, and it was noted interesting that in America, for example, the crimes are actually you know more. Uh, I think they compared it out of you know a population of it was like you know how many. Uh, per 1,000 people, right? Um, and, and so they were noticing that in Sardia, for example, um, you know, whatever their justice system looks like and stuff, you know, that's not the issue. But I'm just looking at the statistics itself, right? So forget, like, you know, if there are more justice or not justice or whatever. I'm just focusing on what the numbers were saying. So they were saying that there are fewer, like, uh, you know, fewer 
crimes overall, and they were, they had different categories um, of what kind of crimes they are compared to uh, compared to the U.S. Right? Uh, they were talking about they compared drugs, they compared you know murder, they compared you know multiple different crimes, and overall the the end result was that there are fewer crimes in, in like in that. Uh, compared to in America, right? in Saudi compared to America. Um, and so this was something interesting. Now, of course, they did note it. They did note that there is more bribery overseas in Saudi than it is over here. Um, so, you know, you know that they're, they're, they did mention some element of truth because there was some balance to it. Uh, but it, they did notice that there were a lot more crimes committed in America compared to in Saudi um, and, and, you know, they were comparing also um, some like punishment style and so on, like how the punishments are carried out and so on. And so it seems that, uh, you know, there is, there is definitely um, this understanding that certain uh, forms of, or certain crimes, if they're punished a certain way, then they have more impact in terms of, uh, in terms of acting as deterrents, as opposed to others. So over here, you have this sort of experiment, right? Life imprisonment. First there was death penalty, then there was like different kinds of them. Uh, then they had uh, life imprisonment as, a, as an alternative and stuff because they thought it was more humane and stuff. But now they're realizing that it's actually like, you know, a person who's living in, in like in prison for the rest of his life. Uh, he's not really able to do anything in society. He's just becoming a burden in a way to society because society has to take care of this person um, until, you know, whatever, you know, whatever, until that person dies. Whereas, you know, if the person uh, in both cases, you know, died, right? And it, and it didn't harm society as a whole, right? It, it didn't sort of like take resources from society, then maybe that was a bit more effective and, 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 and it might actually act as a stronger deterrent in committing the crimes in the first place because the person knows that they're gonna, their life is going to be taken if they take somebody else's life. If they're going to murder somebody, if they're going to rape somebody, if they're going to do those kinds of crimes, their punishment is going to be something that's going to be uh, like immediate. It's going to be like very, you know, like uh, very, very, um, uh, like harsh depending on not harsh but like you know very uh like a, i don't know the word for it but like um it's going to be something it's going to be a big deal it's not going to be something minor and stuff right it's not going to be something they're going to just like live their days out in like in, in a prison or whatever and stuff right so you know the, the the impact is going to be a certain way so if you look at death penalty for example and that's something like you might see as a negative it's actually a good thing uh, and it's it's actually going through uh, the preservation of uh nefs as as you know directly um, because it's focusing on preventing other people's lives, for example, uh, being taken. But it's also uh, in, the, in the context of other things. For example, uh, there's an ayah in the Quran. إِنَّمَا جَزَاءُ الَّذِينَ يُحَارِبُونَ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ وَيَسْعَوْنَ فِي هَذِي فَسَادًا أَنْ يُقَتَّلُوا أَوْ يُصَلَّبُوا ذَا The punishment for uh, like waging يُحَارِبُون uh, means like you're, you're sort of like waging war against like Allah and his messenger and you're causing and you're like rushing to cause like corruption in society, right? Uh, that they're rushing to uh, cause corruption and like, you know, like a, a negative stuff in society. Then the punishment for this person who's causing this terrorism, right? Is that they are supposed to be killed or crucified, right? Um, and in this case, they usually have, you know, um, uh, also, uh, the opposite hand, you know, and the feet being cut off and stuff, right? So this is uh, equivalent to the, the crime that they're doing because it's not just killing somebody. Now you're actually terrorizing a group of people and stuff, right? So that's worse than killing one person. Um, if, if you're sort of like, you know, instilling this, you're taking away the sense of security from a society, from a group of people, then the crime is even, uh, is even worse than killing one person. And killing one person is in itself, you know, one of the biggest crimes that you can do. Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, وَالَّذِينَ لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ لَا آخِرَ وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّاسِ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَّا بِالْحَقِّ That, you know, among other things, that, you know, the people like these Ibad Rahman, these, these slaves of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, of Rahman, the most merciful, what they, do, they don't do is that they don't call unto other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and another, the other thing, another thing that they don't do, they, they don't call other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but they also don't kill people, right? Except if there is right. So, uh, except if there is like, you know, um, right to it, as in there, there is something that there is, um, uh, if there is like a you know a proper place to do it, for example, um, life for a life in in a case where the family doesn't, but the family wants equal justice instead of forgiving and so on and stuff, right? So in that case, uh, th that's the only time that they take life and stuff, right? It's not something where they're just like arbitrarily taking it and stuff, right? So this is one of the criteria of being one of the slaves of the most merciful, um, and so this is something that is uh, yeah death penalty. What's another truth 
that we have in life um, and we can compare based on, you know, what the truth is and what we have sort of adopted as the truth. Something else. I guess I was thinking of um, just taking care of ourselves. Like it's very popular to be um, fit and healthy. Okay. So let's talk about health and fitness, right? So from an Islamic perspective, health and fitness actually would go in their preservation of uh, a nafs, of life, but it also can go into preservation of aql, right, uh, of intellect, but it also can go into the protection of uh, uh, deen, right, and it also can go into the preservation of al-mal, right, and it can also go into potentially the preservation of a nest. And how does it go in, you know, the preservation of life, of soul, right, of the soul, um, it is obvious, you know, because you're taking care of yourself, you're healthy and fit and so on. But the Prophet said, said also mentioned about the strong believer uh, being more um, beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than a weak believer, right? Because the benefit that comes out of this, um, of a strong believer, are, uh, are more than um, a person who's a little bit weak and stuff, right? And, and this is referring, you know, obviously it's also including, um, uh, like, you know, and this is referring to like the, the actual physical strength that a person might have and stuff, right? And, and this is not uh, referring to, uh, you know, like, you know, males and females and stuff. We're not comparing that. We're just talking about males in this context because obviously you don't compare male and females and stuff, just like you don't compare apples and oranges and stuff, right? So there is definitely a difference between it. So we're talking about among males, um, if, if, a believer is strong uh, than that, like, you know, physically, then that person is strong, uh, is, is more beloved than the weak one, although both of them are, have good in them. So the Prophet will clarified that. Um, uh, so that's important over here. So um, that's one of the things that also in the story of Musa alayhi salam, you see that, um, uh, you see in the story of Musa alayhi salam, when he went to, um, uh, to uh, to Madian, the, the city, and um, he when he went there, um, the uh, when he helped the ladies out over there, you know, at the well. After that, the the you know in in the conversation that one of the women had uh, with their father, uh, they mentioned that he is Qawi. Qawi it means that he is strong. And Amin was another character, so which is like you know he's he's trustworthy, reliable, and so on, right? Um, and that was that. So Qawi is one of the attributes that they, they uh, that she mentioned. And so this was something that you know uh, we know that that that's a, a very um, powerful uh, uh, attribute that a person might have, literally, right? Because that's referring to the person's like physical strength and so on. And we know that this uh, that the um, the Prophet Jahari himself, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, gave them. Uh, extra strength and he gave them perfection of you know human body for example um, so in the context of the Prophet he had the strength of more than uh, he had the strength of several men right uh, Musa alayhi salam was also a very strong fit man and stuff, right? so the Prophet uh, uh, um, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave the Prophet salam, this perfect physique right and so we know that you know a person who's strong can do multiple different things if he needs to work he can do you know he can work but also when it comes to um, doing extra good deeds, for example, he'll be able to do that more, right? So for example, if he needs to pray at night, if he's healthy and strong, he can do that. When you work out, um, some of the benefits of working out, I'm sort of uh, going into uh, the, you know, the benefits of working out as, as you know, the people that are into uh, sports science and so on, that they're gonna know uh, into fit, health and fitness. Um, they're gonna know about this, right? And uh, part of the, you know, uh, the training that I had when it came to like certification for you know, fitness and so on, uh, the, one of the things that they were really emphasizing in this was telling us about how um, how how scientifically proven it is, right? And I'm gonna focus on science a little bit. Uh, how they've been you know doing studies and stuff, and how it's been shown that exercise can impact in a positive way many aspects of your life. It can help in, in terms of uplifting your uplift, up, uplifting your mood. Uh, it can help you in terms of your heart, in terms of your brain. It, it, it can it can help you in many different ways, right? Your social interactions and stuff. Everything becomes uh, improved. So, for example, uh, in the context of your brain, um, your brains are obviously going to become a little bit stronger when you work out more, right? Um, it's stronger meaning like you know they're going to be you know, you're going to have more clarity. You're going to be able to do more things and stuff. You're going to have a lot more. Uh, 
capacity in terms of you know things that you're able to process and you know analyze and think and stuff right so that's going to happen if you are uh, working out more and so that's important because you know if you have a stronger intellect then you're going to be able to do a lot more things and stuff if you have um, and you're going to be able to help people uh, in a better way than if you were sort of like clouded in terms of your judgment and stuff you're demotivated you're not really helping out in society you're not connected with things and stuff so all those things are going to be uh, taken away and replaced by a better like a, a more positive uh, outlook on life but also a like a stronger mind and so on um, and obviously you know um, people like to look good and stuff for like that they like their spouses to look good and stuff for like that so marriages and stuff you know all that stuff is going to work out even better and stuff obviously uh, that's something that's self-explanatory also um, and so everything is sort of impacted when you work out so Allah Sahadara does put emphasis on on this right here right and so Allah Sahadara also mentions don't kill yourselves right so that's another thing right there. So if you're not taking care of yourself, if you're not healthy and stuff, you're not doing exercise and so on, that does necessarily impact how you are in terms of you know, your overall health and well-being and stuff. And as you know, over time, as time goes on and stuff, uh, you sort of get overwhelmed by certain things. And so um, uh, you, your body needs to have some sort of like activity and movement and stuff. And in a very sedentary lifestyle, um, when you're working in an office and stuff, for example, you're just sitting all day, then you get back in your car and you're sitting all, you know, until you get home and stuff, and then you come home and you sit all day long, you know, until the rest of the night, and then you go to sleep and stuff. It's a lot of the sitting, sitting stuff, right? And so that can negatively impact your body. In fact, they did some research and they realized that um, sitting down, just sitting down as opposed to even lying down, right, or even like standing and walking around, sitting down has a lot more pressure on your back uh, than if you were standing or lying down, right? So that's something that's another thing. Uh, so they were saying if you need to sit down, you need to have the proper chair, for example, and you know, posture has to be a certain way and so on. So they discussed that as well. So the point is over here, health and fitness, Islam puts a lot of emphasis on it. So if you're exercising a lot and stuff, then that's you're actually doing something that's that is encouraging because there's so many benefits that come out of it, right? And you can pray more, you can help more, you can volunteer more and stuff. You're not always tired and, you know, fatigued and stuff. You're actually very vibrant and you're actually, you're, 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 you're more positive in terms of your outlook. A lot of the things that you're doing are more helpful to society and so on. So overall, health, health and fitness is extremely emphasized in Islam. But what is the truth then? Right? What is the truth here uh, uh, that people have sort of adopted and you know we sort of go by and we just say it's you know whatever. So we sort of might say, uh, what's something that you think might be the truth over here that's compared to, comparing to this over here? Like we know that there is a society that's you know sort of pushing towards health and fitness, but there's also a different movement that's coming in because of the image that. Um, you know this image society uh, this this idea of the, your image and stuff and uh, all that so there is this uh, counter movement that's coming up um, and this because it was sort of an extreme push towards health and fitness and like you know this idea of perfect you know what perfection looks like and how everyone should look like that so when that happened you know a lot of people sort of started looking at, at themselves and sort of comparing themselves with what's going on outside um, or what that perceived uh, uh, the epitome of beauty was and they compared themselves and they started going in, you know, negative cycles and so on. And so, you know, there's, uh, there's this increase of like uh, frustration of yourself with yourself and sort of like looking down on yourself and sort of becoming demotivated, and overwhelmed, and depressed and, you know, all that. Um, and, and these are things that, you know, obviously need to be addressed. But at the same time, um, to it, it sort of like, you know, it started like a sort of um, opposite extreme, which was that. You should be. You should accept whatever image that you have and stuff. You should be like you know nice in terms of like uh, not not really like you know care about what other people say about your body and stuff. And so there was the other extreme of like you know what, be happy with who you are and that's it, right? You don't need to change. You don't need to become better and stuff like that. So that's sort of you know what the the culture sort of like pushed back with and stuff. They said okay, well, the, this this extreme on this one hand saying that everyone needs to have a very specific you know certain like you know uh, look. Uh, that that right there sort of backfired. So then, like there was a counter movement of like, okay, well, you should be happy with whatever it is that you want to do and stuff, right? However you want to look and stuff, it's okay. If you have, if you're, you know, in, from from the the perspective of, um, like, you know, from the you know whatever grade scale that they use to determine what's overweight and what's not overweight by looking at what's typical and what's atypical, right? Um, you should sort of not worry about that, you know, as long as you are living, you know, you're fine and stuff, you're breathing or whatever, then you shouldn't really worry about like, you know, doing whatever, you know, exercise wise and so on, right? Now, exercise is good, but if you're not doing it, you should be accepting of your body and stuff like that. And that's it, right? Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, 
that this is a very simple thing in the sense that you know, everyone can just go to this you know, perfect physique and stuff. But I am saying that you know, it shouldn't deter us from actually exercising and staying fit and so on, right? Uh, that we should sort of have that part of in our in our daily life and stuff, right? Um, so, for example, in the training, they were teaching us how to work with people that have certain you know goals of losing weight, but they might be like you know, extra, extra uh, uh, overweight from that you know from that grading perspective and so on, so on. Um, and so, uh, it's to say that you know we should definitely try our best. Um, if we have you know some hereditary uh, influence then it doesn't, it shouldn't cripple us. So they would, they would say, for example, in the training that, um, fitness, for example, um, uh, it, it's something that can impa be impacted by your genes, right? But you're not limited by it. that just because somebody has great genes and stuff doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be perfect uh, in everything and stuff. Right. Uh, and that's, that, that's it. They're going to succeed and they're going to sort of have an advantage over everyone else and stuff. So that's not necessarily true. Um, because you also have hard work and everything else that comes along with it and stuff, right? So a person who may not have the best genes, they can outdo another person who has better genes and stuff because of the hard work and other things that they did that sort of like, you know, offset uh, the fact that they didn't have the, the same genes and stuff. So definitely work on it. And it's not something that you should be polarized on one end or the other end. And so um, I'm going to say this as like, you know, all or nothing meant in my insight. And some people might say, for example, you know, from they might look at this and say, well, as long as I'm doing like, you know, I'm praying five times a day, I'm doing with this and that and stuff, right? I don't need to do health and fitness. I shouldn't necessarily be part of my, you know, lifestyle and stuff, right? But on the other hand, actually, Sam disagrees with that. Sam says, no, you should be healthy and fit. You should be doing that because it's actually going to help you in, in everything. It, it helps you in all of these categories, right? Uh, if you're not fit and healthy and stuff, your form in salah is not going to be good and stuff, right? Uh, if you're not, you know, if you're not stretching and you're not doing all those things, you're not going to have perfect record, for example. You're not going to have perfect to do it. You're not going to be able to help people. You're not going to be able to keep on going. Your, your endurance is going to be low. You're going to get tired easier and stuff like that, you know. So these things are going to hamper your ability to be actually a good, like a positive, uh, strong uh, contributor to society, to your family, to every, you know, to yourself in terms of like your ability to keep moving forward and keep on doing good things and stuff like that. So that's going to be hampered. So Islam does not... Uh, uh, some sort of discourages that kind of thinking and it encourages instead to be very um, uh, always trying to strive to become better in terms of physical uh, fitness and so on. So health and fitness, that's one of the Okay, what's another thing? And as you as you're coming up with other things, you know that the Prophet Sallam himself used to, uh, you know, the Sahaba used to wrestle, the Prophet Sallam himself used to wrestle sometimes. Um, and so this was the thing that they used to do. So they, they, there was this idea of like, you know, fitness and so on. Something else? Um, the, the idea of continually learning and reading and uh, yeah, just throughout your life, continually educating yourself. Let's say, okay, so constant learning and mental growth, sort of. Um, so, yeah, so if uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages you to do that, because if you don't know something about, like, you know, about life or about, about uh, you know, about the deen and stuff, right, then you're not going to be able to uh, grow as a person. You're not going to be able to avoid mistakes that could have happened and that you could have avoided otherwise. You're not going to be able to keep on, like, you know, um, succeeding in the things that you need to succeed in. Um, and, and this is something that's uh, one of the most common uh, things in Islam that you need to constantly keep learning and keep learning, right? Uh, in, in the context of deen, Allah subhanahu wa says, first, Alu So ask those of knowledge, uh, the people of knowledge, if you don't know yourself. So if you don't know something, go ahead and ask, right? And the Prophet said, I'm also mentioned a person who seeks out, you know, who goes on the path of learning knowledge about Allah subhanahu wa you know, the deen, deen, uh, deen knowledge, uh, that he, if he takes a step towards, he takes the path towards seeking knowledge, Allah subhanahu wa is going to, make a path uh, to Jannah easy for him. And it's the point that Allah SWT mentions, uh, or in this hadith it continues and it mentions that even the, the, the fish in the ocean um, and you know, also the birds in the sky, for example, and everything that's from the heavens and you know, up to like, you know, the, even the fish in the ocean, so heavens, heavens and the earth, they all, everything that's in there, it, it makes istighfar makes uh, ask Allah SWT to forgive this person that's seeking knowledge. Because what happens is when, when a person learns knowledge, um, then he knows how to put things in their proper places. 
So he knows what's right and wrong. And so he's going to see something bad happening. He's going to stop it. If he's going to see something good, he's going to, you know, facilitate that. He's going to go, you know, support it, right? There's an ayah in Surah An-Nisa. مَنْ يَشْفَعَ شَفَعَةً حَسَنَةً يَكُلْ لَهُ نَصِيبٌ مِنْهَا وَمَنْ يَشْفَعَ شَفَعَةً سَيَّةً يَكُلْ لَهُ كِفْلٌ مِنْهَا That um, whoever is sort of intercedes on behalf of something good, then he carries the, the like, uh, he gets a copy, he gets a share of the reward out of there, right? And whoever uh, sort of facilitates or intercedes on behalf of something bad, right? He's sort of supporting uh, something bad. Then he gets the burden thereof. So what that means is that if you're doing something, you know, good, uh, Allah SWT gives you a copy of the good deeds. And if you're doing something bad, then you get a copy of the bad deeds, right? Um, that are resulting therefrom. So the idea pretty much is over here. If you know what's right, you're going to be able to put the things in, in their proper places. So justice, for example, is putting things according to their needs, right? Uh, there's this idea, for example, of um, uh, just uh, like there's this idea of uh, equality versus uh, equity, right? So um, equality, is the idea is that, uh, you know, in, in the concept of genders, for example, um, equality means that both males and females are exactly the same and you should treat, treat them exactly the same, right? That's what equal means, right? That both sides are the same. So if you have the equal sign, uh, five plus five is equal to two times uh, five, right? They're both the same at the end of the day. They're exactly the same, right? And if you were to put them on a scale, it's exactly the same in that sense, that everything about them, all their attributes, everything is the same, sort of like that's the idea of equality. Uh, equity is that uh, some people might be uh, better off in certain things and some people might be worse off in certain things, but they sort of balance each other out because, you know, one might be good in something, but they might be, uh, they might be good in something, but they might, they might be bad in something else. And the other side might be bad in what the first one is good at, and they might be good in what the other person is bad at, right? And so they sort of balance each other out and stuff, right? Um, and so that's that. So you have some rights that, you know, one, one group has certain rights, the other group has some other rights, and, and uh, but they sort of balance each other out because uh, in the grand scheme of things, all things are sort of balanced out. Um, and it's not just like, you know, in everything that they have to be equal, but overall, the, the um, if you were to average things out and stuff, then it would be the same, right? Um, so that's that. So as opposed to 5 plus 5 equals 5 plus 5, like in the first uh, first thing, now you could say that as long as the you know overall average is the same, then we're good to go, right? And so it's about averages as opposed to, um, you know, every specific detail. Now, naturally, because, uh, you know, a, as simple as males and females, they're, they're different biologically speaking, right? Uh, physiologically speaking, in every way that, you know, there's differences, that's very apparent, you know? So in that, in that context, um, it, it's not going to be fair if they get the same prescription and that you standardize the rules for both of them the same way. So you're sort of saying like, uh, you know, the, the criteria that you're using for men, that's the criteria that shouldn't be applied in women as well, right? That's not, that's not fair because women may not be able to do certain things that men are able to, and men are not going to be able to do certain things that women are going to be able to do. So if you apply the criteria that was customized for one, but you sort of, you know, sort of apply it in another group, then that's not fair. And if you sort of apply a criteria that's supposed to be, you know, relevant, uh, relevant to both, um, then obviously you're not accounting for the differences and not accounting for people's differences, not accounting for diversity that you have, right, can necessarily uh, impact in a negative way the, the way that the dynamics work out at the end of the day. So that's that, right? So if you constantly grow and you constantly learn, that helps you, you know, in many different ways. Among them, uh, from a social perspective, you're able to put things in the proper places. And if you know what the right thing is, then you're going to be able to do that. If you don't know uh, about your situation, your context, and so you're not going to be able to apply rules. There's a concept in, in fiqh that a faqih needs to understand the complete picture before he gives a ruling, right? So when he's given a matter, he has to ask questions. He needs to understand all the details and stuff before he gives an answer to it, before he gives you a ruling on that particular topic, right? And if he doesn't know it, then he's not allowed to give an answer. And and this is a, you know this is a this is one of those um, understood maxims in, in fiqh, right? Um, that this is how it's supposed to be done. Now the Prophet also mentioned that all of us are shepherds, kulukum uh, rain. That all of you are uh, shepherds, and everyone is going to be asked about whatever they had, or, you know, they were shepherds over, in, or whatever you sort of had the domain over in a sense, right? Whatever you were responsible for. 
and then he mentions you know the husband for his family the the, uh, the wife for her her you know for for the ki- for the kids in the house and so on and then he mentions you know also uh, he also mentions the like the the king for example or the ruler being responsible for all those that are under him that, he, that he's responsible over and so on he's going to be accounted for all those things and stuff right and so in this context you know if you and he said all of you are like that meaning every one of us has some authority uh, over somebody else or something else some you know some important matter or something like that so we're always going to be accountable for everything that's under us right and so in that context the more you learn the more you're going to be able to put things in their proper places but also uh, it's mental stimulation the more you learn the better the more easier it is for you to navigate life for to navigate new situations and contexts and so on and so that's what um, we were discussing last time as well and you know up until now we've been talking about this so the more you learn about the truths the more you're going to be able to uh, find your life becoming easier but if you don't learn about reality you're not going to know how to navigate it right so the more you learn the more it helps you in, the, in that sense as well sort of like you know so, uh, it helps you uh, navigate life it helps you understand how things work it helps you interact with people in a better way all these you know constant growth and development is going to help you overall become a better person you're going to learn more you're going to understand more you're going to know how to interact with everything around you that includes people that includes you know uh, animals that includes plants that includes everything right so well, when it comes to climate change you're going to know how to handle that situation from an islamic perspective because you're going to know how reality works and stuff right uh, that uh, you know there is there is this emphasis in islam as well that anything that harms us you know uh, then we need to sort of ward you know sort of uh, stop it so if if there is this thing where uh, our actions are harming you know overall uh, the the world um, then and it's hamper, it's sort of negatively impacting us and it's going to negatively impact those people out there that are coming after us then it stems against that right and so you understand that so when it comes to uh, climate change you're going to have an active stance um, uh, with, you know, in that sense right you're also going to have an active stance against injustices because you're going to know what's unjust what's not right what's right you're not just going to be guessing and checking and stuff like the you know like we talked about prison system and so on um, and and when it comes to uh, pretty much what's right what's wrong in general you're going to know that more and more but it's also going to help you in terms of keeping your mind sharp because the more you learn the more you're going to be able to think you're going to be able to analyze things you're going to critically think you're going to evaluate things and so on that's that's another thing that's a part of learning so it's that actually encourages education then right uh, it, it encourages you to learn about things that you know imam shafi for example mentioned that a person should you know he, he should also learn uh, or, or like you know one of the one of the fields that he mentioned that a person should learn is medicine and he said that so like you know dean is going to help you from uh, the, the aspect of um you know like you know the overall you know body the mind and so and so and all that stuff but medicine is also going to help you in terms of like you know how, uh, addressing the issues that are going to happen to your physical body right so if you cut yourself for example or uh, if you have an, an, like a heart problem and stuff or if you have whatever so you're going to be able to um, address that based on that learning that you've had so health you know it's being a doctor for example and knowing medicine and so on uh, he encouraged that he said this is one of the best things that people could do and so this is important the prophet said him also encouraged seeking he he, he encouraged the, the seeking of treatment um, and so this, these are good things so learning is going to help you be able to do all those things and so um, it's going to help you in terms of how to take care of yourself how to take care of your family if you don't know how to make money for example if you don't have any kind of sort of um, uh, like training for example whether it's like education you know a formal education or a degree or some sort of vocational training or something like that then you're not going to be able to protect your family uh, you're not going to take, like take care of your family right and so that preservation uh, of your lineage for example is going to get impacted your your life is going to get impacted um, your dean is potentially going to get impacted because you're not going to have enough time to you know to focus on that you're going to be so worried constantly about your de- about your well, you know your sustenance and so on that even when you're praying you're going to be worried about that so your focus is going to go away from that so your relationship to Allah Hantare is not going to be well and stuff because you're so fixated on this stuff right um, and obviously protection of, uh, of property and wealth and stuff is not going to be there as well so you're going to miss out on all these things right and that's going to impact a lot of people and so Allah Hantare would then encourage you to seek the things that you need to know to make the earning that you need to have uh, in addition to all the other things that we've already talked about about this right so that's that's that so on the other hand um what is the uh, you know a lot of times the mindset is that you learn a very specific science uh, or a specific 
uh, education and sort of stop, right? So you got your degree and you became a doctor and sort of you stop. You became a lawyer, you sort of stop. You become an engineer, you sort of stop. Um, you think that you got everything now and you understand everything, right? Um, or you sort of don't continuously grow. Now, uh, some of the people on the other hand, like, you know, uh, CEOs of companies, they, they, you know, apparently many of them will read um, very frequently. They're going to read a book in a day or something, or like a week or something like that. So they, they, they constantly read and they try to keep growing and stuff like that. So it's time actually encourages this, right? That you're supposed to keep learning new things and stuff like that. Now, definitely the first thing that you should learn is, the, you know, the dean. And so you should always have that you know, as a daily routine. But in addition to that, you should also learn other things, right? Um, and so we have this idea with the youth that they should not be zombies. So, uh, and the zombie idea is like, you know, you're not learning. And so you're sort of like, sort of, you sort of uh, stop learning. And because you stop learning, you're sort of becoming like mindless zombies and stuff essentially, right? Um, and, and so that's the idea that we want to counter. And it also the addiction to uh, watching like movies and like, you know, the, like dramas and stuff like that, immersing yourself too much into it can also sort of uh, have a negative impact because um, oftentimes you're sort of sitting down and turn off your brain, just watch something and stuff so that you can like spend some time and sort of like, just like not think about anything, right? So that can, uh, that can negatively impact you if it's done to an extreme. So we don't want to do that, right? And so this idea that sometimes people have is that like you get this education, you're sort of done, uh, or you get a very specific education. Like you don't learn Dean, you just learn, uh, you know, a bit, you just become a doctor and somehow you know how the world works and stuff and, uh, and, and that's it, you know? So you'll see like in organizations or massages or, you know, at different places and stuff, you'll see that the Shura members and stuff can also become like this. Whereas Islam actually encourages you not to be like that. They become like that. They've only learned one thing. They haven't studied Dean, for example, but they're making decisions for, you know, from a Dean perspective, or they're, they're making decisions for people um, under the guise of Islam, under the under this banner of Islam and stuff that they're making, you know, Islamic decisions, essentially, right? Because they're impacting people. But they haven't studied that. They don't know how, how um, what Islam says to do, certain, you know, in, in different contexts and stuff. So they're not supposed to be, you know, in this position, but they are. Um, and so this is something that we need, you know, we need to understand that Islam encourages constant growth, starting with Islam, uh, that you're supposed to know this because this is who you are. That's how you define yourself, right? Uh, identities uh, are defined by what you are sort of like, you know, what, what is the most important thing to you in your life, right? Um, and so if Islam is the most important thing, your, your title could be Muslim, right? But if it's not the most important thing, then you should, you know, like the other identities would be more more appropriate for that person and stuff, right? So that the most important thing is Islam for you because you're submitting to Allah Taala and that's what defines you, then you're a Muslim, right? But if, if that's not the case and stuff like that, then, you know, there just needs to be a serious discussion on that topic. So I hope that made sense. Um, what's another thing? Is there anything else that, like, that comes to your mind? Mm. Not off the top of my head. Okay. How about this? So um, our, our our perspective is more actions focused, right? As opposed to results, right? In this case, in the truth, is that you're focusing so much on results. Meaning, and, and let me differentiate it so you don't get confused. So in Islam, you're supposed to put your effort, right? You're supposed to do your research. You're supposed to do, you know, your consultation and stuff. Uh, and consult them in your matter, right? Um, so you should have consultation. That's definitely there. You should also, you know, make istikhara, for example, of like connecting to Allah and making dua and stuff that you're asking Allah for guidance, right? Istikhara is the seeking of what's, what's khayr for you, right? That's what istikhara means. Uh, the, you know, the, the way that the word is um, uh, formed in Arabic, it's like you're seeking uh, the best from Allah SWT, the khayr from Allah SWT. So you're seeking istikhara from Allah SWT. You're, you're consulting with them and trying to get something that's guidance and stuff like that. So, uh, that right there, in Islam, you're focused on uh, the actions, but you're not fixated on very particular, specific results. Okay? So, Allah didn't promise you that you're going to become a doctor. But, He allowed you to make that, you know, this, you take the steps appropriate for that. 
but he didn't confirm and guarantee that you will become that at the end of the day because he didn't tell you necessarily uh, in your particular case what exactly it is that's beneficial beneficial to you outside of what he gave you as you know as general rules for Islam and for Muslims, right? But you know specifically for you in a very particular context and stuff, that answer is not like given to you. So for example, me. Uh, what's best for me in this particular, like you know, the next thirty minutes, for example, I don't know, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, you know, has given me instructions and stuff, general instructions, but He didn't tell me specifically what's going to happen in the next thirty minutes and how I need to navigate that, you know, very specifically in detail. I hope that makes sense. I hope that I'm also not, um, uh, like, um, uh, giving, I'm not confusing you in this sense. But when it comes to you know the world that we live in, a lot of times the mindset is results focused. As in, you need to get particular results, and that's the end of it all. If you don't get those results and stuff, then you screwed up, and it's your fault and stuff, and you know something's wrong with you and stuff, and and all that stuff, right? And so, when you have that mindset, then when things don't go your way, you're gonna become depressed, you're gonna become anxious, you're gonna become stressed out, you're gonna become worried and stuff, right? And that's not something that Allah Taala wants you to do, right? You just need to understand that you gotta put your effort in, you gotta try your best, you gotta do your research and all that stuff, and then go forward. But if it doesn't happen, it's okay because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala might have, you know, Allah may know something different than what you've approached as being the best for you, and so He's going to make that happen instead of what may have been as good as uh, as good for you, and that's it. Like that's what we understand, right? So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Wallahu yalamu antum la taalamu," and and you know, before that. You mentioned that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala saying maybe uh, you might love something and it's bad for you, maybe you hate something that's good for you, and then He says, "Wallahu yalamu antum la taalamu," that. Allah knows and you don't know, right? And we don't know because we don't know the future. So we don't know all the details about it. Um, and we don't know about every other person's situation and stuff. So we don't know, uh, you know, what's best for us. We don't know what's best for other people and so on. So we can't be fixated on very particular results. And a lot of times you'll see that people wanted certain things, but um, they didn't get it. And so they sort of give up in life. They lose motivation and that's it. So we don't want to do that. So the truth is that, our, you know, the dunya is created um, in a way where we are supposed to do our part, research and stuff, right? Do our due diligence, but not get so fixated on particular results that if we don't get it, that we sort of give up on life, right? And, and, and you know, people have different, uh, different levels of this giving up. Some people might give up in certain areas. For example, they've been trying to, uh, let's go with health and fitness. They've been trying to work out, but they just sort of like, they try and they do it for like a week and stuff. And then they sort of like, you know, that's it. They give up and stuff. They lose motivation, right? So uh, when they do this, when they give up, they're thinking, well, I tried it and it didn't work. And so I'm just going to give up and that's it. They didn't realize that um, maybe, maybe the, the, you know, the idea was that they needed to work and they need to constantly be, you know, on it and like, you know, be working out and stuff. And they need to consistently do that. And then the growth is going to come over time. And that they should not give up just, just like that because they didn't see the results they wanted when they wanted it. But maybe the results are going to come over the next like 10 weeks, right? As opposed to the one week. Maybe the results are going to come after the second week instead of the first week, right? So you need to understand that just because you want something very specific the way you want it and how you want it, when you want it and stuff, that's not guaranteed by Allah SWT. And it may not even be good for you the way you want it because you might have missed out I, uh, many, uh, you might have not thought about many things that, are gonna, that could be possible uh, uh, end results in the future for, with that particular action. So that's not that it's going to guide you accordingly. But you know, but over here, um, the the small key truth is where you sort of results focus, and if you don't get that results, you sort of give up and stuff. So this is the negative um, aspect of that. So we don't want to have that. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala wants you to put the actions in after doing your research and due diligence and constantly evaluating. Um, but it's not that if if you if you don't get what you wanted exactly how you wanted that you give up and you sort of get fired or whatever else and stuff, right? Now, of course, if there are certain things that you can measure, you know, and these are these are things that um, you could have done, right? Uh, like you had certain goals and stuff. Uh, for example, you wanted to you you were so you were required to put in forty hours a week of work, for example, right? And you only did thirty hours and stuff because you got lazy and stuff, right? That that's that's obviously that's obviously a different scenario. We're not talking about that. We're talking about like certain like goals and stuff um, that are sort of like life goals or like you know big goals and stuff like that that you uh, didn't have full control over, right? But you sort of assume that you have full control over it, and then you started like you know thinking that well it didn't happen, so therefore something's wrong with me, right? Or or 
I just need to give up or I tried everything and stuff. Why is the world hating me and stuff, right? Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala do this to me? And so you sort of give up because you assume that your uh, what you considered best for yourself was what was best for you. And you wanted Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give you exactly that, right? But maybe it wasn't good. Maybe it was going to harm you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it away from you. And he was actually protecting you. So that's that. Now, in this context, that would uh, impact your aql, right? Because you're going to be stressed out and your mental capacities are not going to be as they would have been otherwise, right? So if you're very stressed out, but you're being like very pessimistic about life and stuff and so on, then this is what's going to get impacted. Um, also, uh, obviously your preservation, or your, you know, your, your ability to go and work and stuff is going to be hampered because you're going to be stressed out at work. You're going to be overwhelmed and stuff. You're not going to have the good performance and so on. That's going to get impacted, right? And overall, that negativity is going to help other, uh, you know, it's going to help, uh, or sorry, it's going to harm other aspects of your your uh, health, right? So for example, in a, when your mental health is not, uh, str- uh, it's not, uh, it's not taken care of, right? Your body can get impacted negatively, right? You're gonna, your your body is gonna feel more tired and fatigued and stuff. For example, you're gonna have you know body pains and stuff. You're gonna have a lot more issues that are gonna result because of that mental health issue that is that sort of like sitting there that that hasn't been addressed, right? So it can impact you know not just your uh, in, uh, in, uh, like, uh, mental health, but it can also help uh, impact your physical health. So that's very important, and as a result. How in the world are you going to be able to focus on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How in the world are you going to be connecting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you're praying and stuff? You're not going to be able to. So all these things get impacted. And then your relationship with your family and stuff is going to get impacted. And so on. So this is a lot of things that can happen uh, if, you, if you have the wrong mindset, right? So that's that. What's another thing that you have? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages diversity uh, in terms of marriage, in terms of interactions and so on. There is this encouragement that we're supposed to, you know, connect with each other, that, you know, everyone has different unique ideas and stuff like that. These are good things, right? Um, and, and the ayah says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says he created us. Uh, he created all, you know, mankind and stuff uh, into like um, like groups and tribes and stuff that, you know, شعوب uh, وقبائل لتعارفوا So that you would know each other, right? And in أَكْرَمَكُمْ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ يَتْقَاكُمْ that the most honored among you is the one that has most taqwa, right? Meaning the one who is most connected to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and most perceptive of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, most, uh, uh, m- most aware of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the sense of like he's mindful, right? So most mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So uh, diversity is encouraged and uh, nobility uh, based on taqwa. What's over here on the other hand? What is the sort of we've adapted in our cultures and societies and stuff, right? That um, different is not good, is different, different is bad, uh, and uh, nobility uh, based on So this idea of uh, and like a, let's say norm breaker, let's say that right. So this person who takes this like you know this bold action of like going against the norm and stuff right, redefining things and stuff right. That person sort of looked up to. He's like a vanguard. He's a person who like he's, like it's like some that's empowering. Like you're going against the norm. Like people didn't like whatever and stuff. That you don't care about what people think and stuff. You're doing what you know whatever you feel like doing and stuff. They see this person as a very like uh, empowering and so on, right? Um, and, and that um, that's that, right? And if a person doesn't accept this mindset, that person could be bad. Now I I know that these things are changing a little bit, in, you know, in the in the society overall. Uh, they are accepting a little bit more of you know diversity, but up until now that hasn't been the case, and and you can see that with the Black Lives Movement, for example, that you know it, they they realized that over time that mindset had not changed, that you know they didn't consider people um, like different people to have certain rights and stuff. They sort of treated them as like inferior and so on, right? Um, and so that right there uh, is starting to shift a little bit. Um, and it might go to an opposite extreme because, you know, th- when you get polarized to one side, the, the reaction is that, the, that you go to the other extreme, right? So sometimes that happens. Instead of coming in the middle, they sort of jump to the other side, to, like I guess, like to offset things. 
um, and, and so like two polarized uh, groups sort of form and stuff, right? Um, and, and, and you know, generally the people get stuck in the middle and stuff. So the idea over here is that, you know, that up until now, we haven't really accepted that diversity is okay. So for example, when we get married, um, uh, you know, there is in, in, in Muslim culture, for example, uh, not Muslim culture, um, in Muslim societies, uh, in, in cultures where Muslims you know, exist, let's say, right, there is this norm of uh, trying to make it so that we want to have something is like uh, we're not going to let our kids marry um, except uh, from our particular you know uh, specific groups and stuff right so uh, interculture inter intercultural marriages for example are sort of like looked down on uh, they're not okay and stuff if if somebody who's an arab uh, is trying to get married to uh, you know somebody who's uh, black then they're going to be there's going to be a conflict you know between that and stuff right these are sort of things that kind of like permeate through like you know our societies and stuff and, and this is something that we don't really like um and, and we have when we have marriages for example um there are uh there's this thing that, you know, we're just going to invite our own people and stuff and that's it. And we're going to have like very excluded, you know, uh, like uh, invitations and parties and stuff like that, as opposed to sort of like allowing like, you know, the other people to come in too. So if you're very rich and stuff, you're likely going to have only very rich people that coming to your parties and stuff, right? Um, and so that's something that the Prophet him discouraged. He said, uh, there's, a, you know, there's a hadith about this, that when it comes to marriages, that, you know the best marriage like, or like you know feasts and stuff that, that happen um he encouraged the mixing of them so it's not specifically only for the rich people but it's also uh, where poor people are invited so it's a mixture of whoever gets invited uh, it's a mixture um in terms of the, uh, the the people that are attending so it's not just rich people getting you know invited but it's a mixture so everyone is attending so these are the best of uh, wedding feasts for example these are the best of invitations and parties um, because they, it includes everyone in there it's not just specifically focusing on one group of people i don't know if people know this hadith and stuff but it's a really like you know nice hadith right here and the prophet Sassim is actually encouraging this he, he's telling people to not uh, just invite your own people but the best of the you know gatherings and stuff, the best of invitations and stuff are where everyone's invited, the poor and the rich people. It's not like only one group of people. So this is something that's very you know powerful over here that Islam Islam has is built in it. When it comes to the uh, the other side, um, it's sort of like you know um, just how it works out is that we sort of adopt. Uh, this idea that you know we only need to be within our group of people and stuff and so certain people can be very close-minded to this they don't like any kind of diversity so you see that nowadays uh, becoming more apparent um, in our societies right whether in, in, in the west or in the east wherever it might be we're seeing this a little bit it's becoming more apparent that people have these sort of biases against other people they consider themselves as you know sort of like different from everyone else right um, and, and so uh, they don't like that and so they sort of like close off to everyone else right uh, and that's what i mean by different is bad over here that that's the mindset that if you're different from us then you're not you know we, we can't be with you we can't work with you there's something like wrong with you there's something deficient about you and so on and that's sort of permeated like this right even though vocally we might be saying something but in reality in our interactions that's not something that we appreciate so you see a lot of bullying happening happening for example you see a lot of like you know uh, like hate crimes that are happening and stuff right all of that is based on this idea right here. So even though we might sort of profess with the banner, we might carry a banner that says otherwise, but our dealings on, on, on the fundamental level on the ground are being are directly in contrast with whatever we are professing with our tongues and stuff, right? So that's important over here. That Allah SWT encourages diversity, encourages mixing of people and stuff, encourages all that stuff, um, you know, wherever that's possible and wherever that's good, um, it, it'd be great, you know? But it, um, it, it, it doesn't... Uh, like it doesn't allow you to if you look into the hajrat for example it doesn't allow you to be negative and uh, all that with other people so uh that Allah says that you know one group of people should not be scorning or like you know insulting or mocking another group of people um, and this is something that Allah uh, forbids so in the time of you know when the prophet went to medina there there was this tradition among the people um, that they had a good nickname for everyone and they had a bad nickname for everyone so if a person you know did something good or whatever that they would call him by the good nickname and stuff and when whenever that person did something bad or whatever something, something bad happened or whatever they would insult that person with that that, that bad uh, nickname that they had so everyone had two nicknames right and so this ayah addresses this right here that nobody is allowed to do that anymore 
because if I was to listen to Mass, you know, this person is Habi. He, you know, he said, you know, what do you think? And he said, he mentioned that he doesn't like those names, the bad name that he is given, the nickname. He doesn't like it. You know, obviously nobody would like to be called, like, insulted and stuff, right? So if if somebody was called like, you know, um, like a stupid person or whatever and stuff, right? Nobody's going to like to be called that. But if that was your nickname and stuff and something bad happens to you and you're going to get called, that's like adding insult to injury, right? Um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, prevented that from happening and so he doesn't allow this so this is important over here right um that this is the true this is like the the capital t truth because Allah Sada knows how people are going to perceive things how things are going to happen um and what's going to ensure positive interaction and positive growth and you know working together and being nice to each other and stuff is going to facilitate you know a lot of good things whereas doing the opposite is going to cause a lot of problems and stuff so Allah Sada discourages one and encourages the other one and so if we have the understanding um, you know, in terms of how we approach Islam, then all the rules that are in place make sense. They're like, you know, you can understand then that, oh, Allah SWT is giving us this good information or this uh, these rules to make society better. That every time I apply this, it's actually going to make my relationship with other people better, but it's also going to make the world a better place. So these rules are not there to sort of like, you know, confine us and restrict us, and that's it, like to put us down. But it's actually they're they're actually there to empower us and to you know make you know uh, make our lives better. So the more we learn about Islam, right, the more we're going to be able to learn about these things that are going to help us as a society and as well as individually, uh, you know, impact us in a, in an empowering way. Um, but I need to I need to understand this framework. If I don't understand this framework, everything in life is going to become negative. Um, when it comes to looking at Islam, Every, Islam is going to become very you know it's going to seem very restrictive and very controlling and very all that stuff, right? So having the correct mindset is going to help you become healthier and uh, you know uh, it's going to help you become uh, happier in life it's going to help you kind of de de-stress it's going to help you stay motivated and encouraged and positive and all that and it's going to help you at the end of the day so we talked about in the very beginning that uh allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um uh, or we, we talked about in the beginning that having the right mindset is going to help you in terms of de-stressing so in this case if we understand the framework then you, it makes sense for you to, when you kind of sort of fit into it, sort of adapt to it and sort of like internalize it, then everything that you do is going to help you at the end of the day uh, from a Islamic perspective. But if you don't follow Islam and you, and you don't know Islam and you haven't put the right framework in mind, then you're going to look at Islam as very oppressive and negative and all that stuff and very controlling and stuff, right? But And then the, and then you're going to look at it that way and everything that you're going to do is sort of like, you know, a guess and check kind of trial and error thing. Um, and, and this is going to be, this aspect or this side of the chart. So with that, um, I'm gonna pause here and tell I want you to see if you guys can come up with more of these compare, more of these, uh, uh, more of this in a sense of comparison, right? So more capital T truths and uh, more uh, or their counterpart small T truths. So for every capital T truth, uh, have a counterpart lowercase t. Okay. So do this, um, and that's going to be your homework, inshallah, over here. Um, and inshallah, we're going to add to this list a little bit more. But then, we'll, um, because when we add this in, you're going to see the comparison between the two. So you're going to understand where the disconnect happens that makes us, you know, stressed out in life. We're gonna, we get frustrated in life. We're going to we get demotivated in life. Where is that happening from? Because this is how Allah Subhanahu wa Taala designed that maze that I showed you the other day, right? And this is how we're thinking it is, and we're navigating that maze according to this mindset right here. So if we understand what the maze looks like because he's giving us the, you know, the, all the solutions, you know, the, the, the pretty much the, the path to go from the beginning to the end of the maze, right? If we adapt to this, then we're gonna be able to get out of this maze with no problems. And so we're gonna feel empowered because we know exactly how to navigate it. But if we assume that this is how the maze works and stuff, that we're gonna keep, we're gonna keep hitting walls and every time we hit the walls, instead we're going to get frustrated and annoyed and stuff. So this is supposed to be um, a, a contrast, right? Um, and so, inshallah, if you guys can take some time to um, uh, go through this list, go through uh, adding more to this, then it's going to help you, inshallah, in everything that you guys do because it's going to help you see the difference between what reality looks like and what we sort of perceive reality looks like, right? And if we align our perceptions to what reality looks like, then we're not going to be frustrated and annoyed and stuff like that. So that's your homework. Um, and the takeaway again is having the, uh, internalized the framework that we talked about over here, understand like this is how Islam is built, right? And notice that this is only the lowest level of the maqasid. 
there's another level which is the the uh, hajiyat and then this is another level of tahsiniyat tahsiniyat is where you for example um uh, if you have money uh, or that the prophet said for example and this again goes into this truth right here too right that islam is not talk is not telling you to uh, live a very uh, like a frugal lifestyle you're not spending much and stuff is actually encouraging you to spend money uh, you know you donate a lot more and stuff uh, have a nice dress and stuff you know look nice and stuff and things like that these are actually things and i can give you proofs and stuff one of them for example being that the prophet said um, saw a man uh, one time and he was wearing very shabby clothes and so on but then at the end of the day um he uh or sorry he was wearing very shabby like you know like bad clothes and stuff right the prophet said him something like you know don't you have any you know that you have money and stuff like that um or the guy's like no i have like uh you know i have all these sheep and i have all these animals and stuff i have all this property so he's like then why are you not showing that you know because Allah Taala likes for you to show whatever he has given now it doesn't mean extravagance but it does mean decency right so if you have money to have like nice clothes clean clothes and stuff you know they're not like ripped apart and stuff or you're not like dirty and stuff right if you, if you have this then wear it right but if you wore for example a polo shirt because you could afford it right and you weren't being extravagant it was just like you know you know that's better quality for example or whatever and stuff so you're wearing then you have the means to do it then you wear it and that's it Allah that is not going to be upset at that because you're not doing it out of like you know um, like showing off or you know extravagance and stuff you're doing it because you know that this is good quality and you have the means to afford it and stuff so you do it right that's it so this is going to be tahsiniyat because you could have technically gone with the lower quality one right um, and that would have been a necessity one or maybe like you know it was a moderate quality medium quality that would be compliment right uh, or the, the hajiyat but you ended up going with something better so if you have for example money and you're driving a lexus right okay you know it's not you're not doing to show off you're, like if you have money to get like a maserati or whatever and stuff or you know a bugatti and stuff right you have the money but you're like okay that's kind of pushing it and stuff right but i can get a lexus for example so you get a lexus because you have the money, you're not going extravagant and stuff. It is better than a normal car, but it's okay because Allah SWT allows that. That's the embellishment. The Prophet SWT had a very fast camel. Um, and so that was, you know, his thing and stuff, right? Um, and, and so uh, the Prophet SWT also wore nice clothes and stuff. So that's another thing. So understanding that, uh, that, you know, you don't need to go by the bare minimum. That's only to meet your needs, but you don't need to stop there. In fact, Allah SWT encourages you to do the higher level, which is embellishment over here, that the Hsinia to like, make it better and nicer because it helps you then stay focused in things and stuff you're not stressed out you're not constantly living on the edge you're not constantly living paycheck to paycheck and stuff you're, you're not living like that so your mind is clear you're more relaxed so you're, you're going to be able to you know spend more time in ibadah and stuff you're going to be able to help more people and stuff like that because of that you know that so going towards the higher stuff is actually helpful in terms of uh, pre preserving deen from your own perspective in terms of your intellect and stuff and your mind and stuff right so it doesn't get messed up or it's not drained by you know constant worries and stress and stuff right so Allah SWT is going to actually encourage you to go to this level that tahsiniyat right and not just get fixated on this so that's another thing that I can mention in here but I want you guys to add more details in other and next time we'll add a little bit more before we go on to how to navigate certain situations and then sort of um, uh, giving you some tools and stuff to move forward inshallah um, and, and that'll be that so i know we talked about a few things but inshallah we're gonna go ahead and finish now